Hello, everyone. Thank you all so much for being with us today. We're going to go ahead and get this webinar started. My name is Elena Stern. I'm the Chief Data Scientist of the Urban Institute, and I'm so excited to be with you all today to talk about using the spatial equity data tool for more efficient and effective equity analysis. We created the spatial equity data tool in 2020 in response to requests from government, nonprofit, and community users for easy to use data tools that would enable them to incorporate rigorous equity analysis into decision-making and advocacy work. Since then, we've been delighted to see the spatial equity data tool used by a wide range of users and applications, including some we never could have predicted when we first created the tool, like using the tool to analyze the distribution of broken McDonald's ice cream machines. As use of the tool has grown in creative, compelling, and impactful ways, so too has the community of power users interested in more rigorously incorporating the spatial equity data tool into their organization's systems and decision-making processes. And while we love the user-friendly web tool, and it's not going anywhere, we realized the web tool wasn't meeting the needs of those users. What those users needed was a way to take the rigorous equity analyses that the tool provides and embed that into their own tools and dashboards and systems within their own organizations to more fully institutionalize use of the spatial equity data tool into their organization's processes. In short, what they needed was an application programming interface. We're so excited that that API finally exists and that we get to share it with you today. We have a really excellent run of show and set of speakers for you today. In just a moment, I'm going to turn it over to my colleagues, Gabe and Sonia from the Urban Institute, who will talk about the spatial equity data tool, why we created the API, and some of the new features that the API enables. We're then so excited to be joined by our partners, Syra and Jonathan from the city of Los Angeles, who will talk about how they're using the spatial equity data tool API to power their own equity data tool. We'll have a moderated discussion with Syra and Jonathan, and then we'll open up the floor to you all for questions and answers. We hope that you leave today feeling excited and empowered to use the Spatial Equity Data Tool API in your own work. And we're going to say this many times today, but let me be the first. We really want to hear from you after this webinar ends. We would love to hear from you about your ideas for new features, your feedback on the tool, how you're interested in using the API in your own work, and if you're interested in partnering with the Urban Institute to incorporate the Spatial Equity Data Tool API into your organization's work. We hope that this is just the beginning of the conversation. So before I hand it over to Gabe and Sonia, a few notes of housekeeping. This event is being recorded and the recording will be posted online afterwards. Uh, we have closed captioning. You can hide captions or adjust settings with the live transcript button. Speaker biographies will be available on the events page we put in the chat and on urban.org. Participants will be muted throughout today's webinar. Uh, if you would like to ask a question for the Q&A session at the end, please use the Q&A box in Zoom to type your questions and comments for the speakers. And then we'll have a short survey at the end of the event to get your feedback. And we ask that you please complete that survey uh, so we can continue to make these events better. And finally, we welcome you to engage with us online using the hashtag live at urban. And so with that, I'll turn it over to Sonia. Perfect, thank you, Elena. Hi everyone, my name is Sonia Torres Rodriguez. I'll be giving a brief overview of the spatial equity data tool and how the web tool has been used since its inception in 2020. At its core, the spatial equity data tool takes a data set uploaded by a user and helps them explore existing disparities in their data. The data set that a user uploads can vary widely and can include data about schools, hospitals, bus stops, building permits, you name it. The only requirement is that this data set is a point data set. This means that each row of the data must include a latitude and a longitude column. The tool compares the user's uploaded data set to the American Community Survey, the ACS, and the counts for various populations at a cho user's chosen geography. So this can include our four geography levels, uh, city, county, state, and national level. After uploading your own data set, the tool automatically calculates two types of scores, a demographic and a geographic disparity score. 
The web tool automatically generates two visualizations and data sets that users can then download. And the API provides these calculations in a flexible to use format. So let's dig in a little bit more about how we calculate these two scores. Say you're asking yourself the question across my city, county, uh, state, or nation, which groups may have more or less access to a given resource? The demographic disparity score helps us answer that question. It compares the locations of the data points and the uploaded data set to where different groups are in a given geography. For example, where children, seniors, veterans, Black, Asian, Latinx people, or people with disabilities live. We do this by comparing the weighted average of the location of the points in the user data to the given demographics of the tracks that a data point is in. Um, with this calculation, we generate an over and an under representation chart, and you can see an example on the slide here. Here we're using example 311 call request data from New Orleans, and we can see in the chart that white communities are overrepresented in the areas where 311 call requests were made, and that black communities are underrepresented in this data set. So the geographic disparity score helps users ask a slightly different question. In a single neighborhood, do residents have more or less access to a resource than we would expect, given the population within a given census tract? So this score is calculated by just taking a simple difference in a, a census tract of the percentage of points in the user uploaded data and comparing it to the overall percentage in the population in that tract. So on this slide, we also see an example of the geographic disparity score. The blue tone tracks show overrepresentation, and we can see a lot of blue around the Tulane and French Quarter area. The yellow tone tracks show underrepresentation, and we can see that the New Orleans East area is near uniformly underrepresented. So, in summary, the tool is very powerful for a few reasons. First, it makes performing standardized equity analysis easy. It is helpful for comparison across time, geographies, and programs. And third, it's free, fast, and reproducible. Both the website and the API are free to use, and they're also open source. So with a little bit of that background, who can use the tool? We envision all sorts of users benefiting from the tool, whether you're in government, nonprofit, or academic settings, across various policy contexts, and for many different use cases. We even envision this tool being used to facilitate community engagement. For example, by creating accessible visualizations that bring in communities into assessing how resources are distributed in their neighborhoods. So here's a few examples of how the tool has been used or could be used in the future. So first, measuring equity and allocation of place-based programs. One example of this has been the Bloomington Pedestrian and Bicycle Safety Commission, where they've used the tool to analyze equity and sidewalk funding allocations. You could use the tool to examine the geographic representative of program participants relative to the target population. For example, a user could upload de-identified data on a new program or service. Um, imagine a new food distribution program at schools and libraries and assess if program participants are geographically representative of the region. You could use it to identify areas for future investment. For example, community groups in Cincinnati have used the tool to identify economic and racial inequities in park crash locations, and that can drive where you're allocating your money. A nonprofit in Marin County has also analyzed disparities in child care center locations. Lastly, you can use it to inform your department or your agency's priorities and measure progress towards equity goals. And this is super important for building accountability with communities and stakeholders that we work with. And we're excited that today, actually, you'll be hearing from our partners at the City of LA, who will be talking about just this, how they've utilized the API to build a custom dashboard to assess progress towards equity goals. And so with that, I'll pass it over to Gabe. Hi, thanks, Sonia. My name is Gabe Morrison, and I'm a data scientist at the Urban Institute. So I want to talk a little bit more right now about why we created the API, how we envision you all potentially using it, and then zooming out more broadly to talk about what an API is and how our API works. Okay, so to start, I wanna talk a little bit more about the motivation. So this first bullet point is exactly what Elena was saying. We have power users who use the, the tool and we wanna facilitate them using it in an even easier way. We have also heard about some feature requests 
for the spatial equity data tool. And so in our process of creating the API, we have wrapped those updates into our development and are launching those as well. And lastly, like Sonia said, part of the ethos of the tool is that it is free and open source. And the API, as we've mentioned, continues to be free and open source. OK, so how might you all use the API? We have a couple different ideas that we potentially want to share. So the first is that we think it could very easily be incorporated into a dashboard. So if you already have a dashboard or tools that focus on equity that you or your department uses, you could consider incorporating the API calculations into that dashboard. Alternatively, the um, you could create a new dashboard and incorporate the API into it. And as kind of Sonia has mentioned, this is um, what our City of Los Angeles colleagues uh, will be presenting on. Second, we think that you could incorporate the Spatial Equity Data Tool API into open data portals. So from kind of a technological capacity perspective, um, lots of open data portals have point spatial data that meet the specifications that Sonia described. We could envision that when a new point spatial data set is uploaded or an existing data set is updated, the portal could call the API, the API could return the analyzed data, and you could visualize the results of our equity analysis calculations. Um, so why is this helpful? You know, it's difficult to say just looking at a map with points on a map whether the distribution of those resources is equitable or not, but our tool, you know, really helps answer that question. So we think the spatial equity data tool can really help give context to a data set. Lastly, we think the API makes it very easy for you to run repeated analyses. So say you have a set of data and it gets updated quarterly and you want to analyze the equitability of that data using the spatial equity data tool. Um, with just the web tool every quarter, that means you would have had to, you know, compile your data, upload it to the tool, get the results, download the data and incorporate that into your workflows. And that, you know, works totally fine, but it's now even easier with the API. You can just write a script that does all that work for you, and you can run that script once a quarter, and it will do everything you need. We also think, on a related note, that this could be very helpful for analyzing change over time or year over year data. So if you have decades worth of data and you want to look at the equity and how that changes over time, you know, it would be very easy to write a script that just for each year of data, calls the API, gets the results, and you know conducts further calculations. So we think all of these are kind of example use cases that are really facilitated by the API. OK, so now I want to talk a little bit more about what, what even is an API and what is our API. So API stands for Application Programming Interface. Um, kind of what does that mean? The API enables users to programmatically interact with the spatial equity data tool through URLs called endpoints. OK, so that's still a little bit abstract. So let's dive into more detail. So this shows exactly how our spatial equity data tool works. And these steps are the same both actually for the web tool or the API. And we just think the API makes, makes doing these steps potentially even easier. But for either way, the first step is you make an analysis request. So potentially, you could use this endpoint we show here to say, hey, spatial equity data tool, here's some data that I have. Please analyze it and return your analyses. Step two is that you can check the status of your analysis request. So that's saying, hey, spatial equity data tool, how, how is this going? Have you, have you finished doing my request? And then step three, once you hear from the spatial equity data tool that it has completed your analysis, you can get the results of that analysis. So that is the three-step workflow and the three endpoints you can call um, for the API. So I know that was kind of a very fast overview of what the API is, but not to worry, we have a blog post if you want to learn more that kind of goes under the hood to describe what, what is happening in more detail about our API. Now I want to talk a little bit more about that kind of new analysis features that we talked about um, that are wrapped into the tool. So we have updated the uh, ACS compar comparison data that the tool uses. So the website now uses the most up-to-date American Community Survey data, and the API allows you to choose among three different ACS vintages. 
I also want to take a moment to acknowledge that if you've been to the tool website today, you'll notice that we recently fixed a data error that was introduced with the update to 2022 ACS data um, that we launched on March 6th. We run a rigorous suite of tests when we make updates and continuously monitor the tool to catch issues before they happen or as soon as possible. This is the first time something has evaded our tests and we've made an update to make sure it won't happen again. We'll communicate transparently on the tool itself when we make changes or bug fixes, and you can go to the version history chapter of our documentation, which I will discuss in more detail in one moment, to see exactly how the tool and the API are changing over time. Okay, so our second um, new feature that is um, allowed by the API is the opportunity to use supplemental comparison data. So this screenshot shows the baseline data sets available for geographic disparity score calculations in our web tool. So that's kind of like a lot of words. What does that mean? Uh, the comparison, so what we have in the background is the map that shows uh, us comparing a resource, which is point bike share data um, in Minneapolis against a baseline population. And in this case, the baseline population is the total population. And you can see kind of highlighted in this pink box, we give seven baseline options uh, to compare the point data sets against. So our API optionally allows you to upload different baseline data sets. So here's an example. Perhaps you have a small business loan program and you want to compare the locations of those loans against the total population of small businesses. So in that case, you'd have your point resource data set, which is the location of loan recipients. And then you have baseline data. In this case, that would be track level, a track level count of all businesses. And that's important. That's like the relative target population for this program, not one of these built-in baseline data sets. So we now allow you to upload that baseline population and get our equity score calculations um, with that baseline data set. So the screenshot here shows geographic disparity scores, but everything I just said is also true of the demographic disparity scores. And lastly, as I mentioned, this is totally optional. So you can use the API and you don't need to upload these supplemental data sets and you'll get calculations just fine. Okay, so now I wanna talk about how to use the API. And I'll talk about two different things here. The first is a R package called setter. Um, so what, what is in this R package? We have functions to call each of the API's three endpoints. So we had those three different kind of forks. And then there's an R function that you can use to interact with those endpoints. So if you're in the R programming language, you don't have to figure out how to um, submit requests specifically or directly to the API. You just use the package and it hopefully makes it easier. We also kind of wanted to make it even easier than that. So we have one function that actually calls each of those three endpoints in one. So it's a one-stop shop for everything you need to do in the spatial equity data tool from specifying your data to getting the results. Um, great. We also, so the package is in beta version. It is launched, um, but it's we are still kind of developing it. And so one thing that will soon be released, but that's under development right now, is functions that will create visualizations that are similar to those in the web tool. So as Sonia showed, you see screenshots like this, and we'll have the ability with a function call to get a kind of analogous chart in, in R for, for these types of visualizations. OK, so the second thing is we have launched public documentation. And this is what I alluded to before. So the documentation covers, covers everything you need to know about the tool. It talks about the methodology. It goes into great detail about the statistical significance calculations we use. It has a discussion of advanced features like weighting and filtering, which we haven't talked about. Um, in short, it's a one-stop shop for all the questions you might have about the tool. We also have a very detailed chapter on the API, which is why I'm flagging it now. So this chapter has example code using setter and R, and it also gives example code just calling the API directly in Python. So if you're ready to use the API and you just wanna see how to do it, this is where you should go. So lastly, as Elena said, we are very open to collaborations. Um, we're always available to collaborate with interested users. We'd love to hear about feedback or questions, or if you're interested in using the API, 
this is our email account. Please send us an email and we can't wait to hear from you. So with that, I would love to pass it over to Saira Gandhi at the City of Los Angeles to discuss LA's custom equity data tool. Thank you, Gabe. Hi, my name is Saira Gandhi. I work for the City of Los Angeles. Um, and go to the next slide. We've uh, been partnering with the Urban Institute for about a year and a half uh, as they've been developing the API and we wanted to also develop um, our own uh, equity dashboard, which we call uh, the measure of access disparity and equity for the city of Los Angeles or our MADE tool. Um, so I work in the part of the city that's called the city administrative officer. Uh, we provide recommendations to the mayor and city council on fiscal uh, conditions of the city. We make recommendations regarding uh, budget uh, resources. And um, a lot of governments have an office that are similar to ours that might be providing analysis to the decision makers in your city or in your uh, state or federal government. Um, and so we were tasked uh, to create an equity tool um, and our team within the office was created in 2001 uh, to think about how our work in the CAO's office um, and providing uh, usually fiscal advice uh, could take an equity lens into our work and to make um, take in more information than just uh, you know how much money the city has as we make decisions about how to allocate resources. So the measure of access disparity and equity tool um, was created with the idea of how can we make uh, not just a new equity index for the city of Los Angeles, but how can we make it actionable into our budget process to sort of think about where uh, we should invest new resources or how to prioritize our existing investments across the city. So our city council directed our office to create a new equity index. And so we looked at equity indices that exist across the country, um, both at the federal level, the state level, and at various local levels. And you know, all of the indices use different um, data indicators, often from the census, to describe um, how there may be disparities of access or uh, disparities of um, ach achievement across cities. And we felt that that information was useful. Um, and we felt that there was a lot of indices that provide a similar analysis to what we created with our equity index. But we wanted to figure out how could we take it a step further and, and not just have an index, but have a way to compare that index against our city resources. And so um, a partner pointed us in the direction of Urban Institute's spatial equity tool, and we developed a partnership to develop our new dashboard um, that I'll talk a little bit more about. Uh, in developing this dashboard, we wanted to answer these questions. We particularly wanted to consider how we could best use our limited city resources to um, to improve equity outcomes. And so our, our guiding light in this process was thinking about how we can use this tool for our budget process, um, but we also wanted it to be available for planning, performance management, and policy development as well. And so we wanted to know, you know, do all Angelinos, regardless of income or neighborhood conditions, have equitable access to specific resources? Um, where should new pieces of infrastructure or where should we increase access of services to communities? And if a program is targeted for a specific community, say if it's targeted for um, older adults, are we targeting those resources effectively? And so we partnered with, with the Urban Institute and our tool uses the API. It has a lot of the functionalities that were described earlier. Um, you know, to calculate the disparities of access of an uploaded data set, 
It also, you know, highlights that under overrepresentation of different communities in relation to that data set. And then finally, what we do um, is we compare uh, that analysis to our own city equity index to assist with prioritization or planning um, decisions. And we also uh, are using the API to make our analysis customizable um, so that it is most useful to the relevant program managers and decision makers. Uh, this is how we uh, can customize the analysis. So we use that, um, what Gabe described earlier with choosing the different population groups uh, that you want to compare against. So for example, if we're thinking about where uh, cooling centers are located across the city, we might be interested in um, something like older adults. Uh, we want to know, you know, are those are those cooling centers underrepresented in different areas? But if we were maybe instead thinking about, you know, where if we had instead a data set of, um, you know, complaints or potholes or other type of things, we might want to know where those are overrepresented. So there's an option to choose what kind of analysis you want. And then this is the part that's the most unique to our dashboard is being able to say, okay, well, on the city's equity index, where do we want to focus our analysis? So if you, um, you know, have very limited resources, you might want to choose our highest priority neighborhoods. And so you might slide this slider up towards, you know, a seven or eight. Um, our, our index uh, has, uh, you know, one being neighborhoods that are most affluent and have more, most access to resources and 10 being neighborhoods that are least affluent and have less access to neighborhoods, uh, re to resources. Um, and so you can, adjust this slider. And then we also produce a table and you can select different census data uh, from the ACS to add into your um, end, re end result table um, for further analysis. So this is the three data sets that we have. There's the um, analysis that comes from the spatial equity data tools API. There's then in the center, our equity index that measures, um, you know, which neighborhoods have more access to different resources. And then finally, uh, the third is where we overlay the two. And so the census tracks that you see highlighted in the yellow color show that this uploaded data set, which um, I believe is, uh, access ramps or ramps where um, on the sidewalk where there's ADA access at the intersection com uh, are underrepresented and it scores um, as a higher priority in our equity index. So these are neighborhoods where then our public works department may want to go and investigate, you know, where are there curbs that do not currently have an access ramp and where should we prioritize maybe building access ramps with our um, upcoming capital budget process? Uh, us, this is the table that gets produced. Um, it is very customizable. And our goal is for this to then be able to be exported and decision makers be able to use it to say, all right, we've gone to this census tract that has a high equity score. It has a big disparity. And we're looking, so we're gonna go to this neighborhood and investigate, okay, there's, we found 10 intersections where we want to put in access ramps. And so we're gonna prioritize this in our budget and they can use this information to justify that budget request. Um, our goal is to further integrate this tool into our budget process. Currently we launched uh, our our prototype of this tool in September um, and had it as a resource for departments in this past budget and budget um, process. But we, our goal is to increase literacy so that people feel more comfortable using it and 
have more time uh, to think about the results from their analysis in creating their budget processes for budget requests for future years. Um, and we'll continue to work with our mayor's office and city council to see, you know, are there ways to make this uh, more of a requirement or an expectation that departments use the tool when developing requests. Um, we've, we went and provided training in October to city departments, uh, but we've already been making improvements. So we will continue to have regular training opportunities so the departments can become more comfortable with using the tool. Um, you know, one of the challenges with this tool is that you really need your data set to be in a clean, uh, easy to upload format with the longitude and latitude. And so uh, part of our training is to help people, you know, understand what their data is and how to clean it so that they can upload it into the tool. Um, and then also interpreting that information and being able to use it to inform uh, decisions or uh, to inform what budget requests are necessary. And then finally, we do plan to continually improve our, our uh, dashboard. Um, we've just sent out a survey to users um, last week and we hope to get feedback about how to encourage more use and you know, one of the challenges right now is a lot of our data sets aren't as easy to convert into that longitude, latitude point data. And so we want to experiment about guidelines of how we can use this tool with maybe a street segment or a, um, or a larger geographic area um, to then provide different types of analysis for city departments. And um, right now, most of our city data is hosted through, geospatial data is hosted through ESRI, through ArcGIS. And so we, we want to also work on um, integrating the API more with those platforms as we move forward. So that's, that's it for my slides. Thank you. I'll pass it back to Elena. Awesome. Thank you so much, Syrah. Uh, and if I can join, ask Jonathan to join us uh, and come off camera, um, or come on camera rather, uh, we'll now have a discussion. I just have a few questions for you both just to dig in more to your great work. I think it will be of interest to our attendees. So Syrah, I'll direct the first one to you. I, I loved you talking about sort of what the main tool does and where we're going next, but let's sort of go back to the beginning and talk about what so motivated you to use the spatial equity data tool API in creating the main tool. Thank you. Yes, as I said in the presentation, we were directed by our city council to create an index. The goal was to use the index in our capital planning process and in our capital budgeting process. Um, and as well, we wanted to apply it to our city budgeting process. However, you know, the the equity index just tells you in a certain location, you know, what is the condition of this census tract? And it doesn't really make it easy to compare to resource allocation. And so we were interested in not just having another index, especially since there's so many indexes out there. Um, you know, in the state of California, we have the Calum virus screen, which our city already heavily has adopted and uses. Um, and, you know, we wanted something additive to that. So that's why we were very excited when we were connected to Urban Institute to start this work. Awesome, thanks so much, Sarah. And I appreciate that insight about how something like the Spatial Equity Data Tool can play really well with an index because there are so many great indices out there and sort of turn it into something that layers in resource allocation considerations uh, along with an index. Um, I'm going to ask you a follow-up question. Um, you know, we've been working on uh, the main tool for a little while now. What has been your biggest lesson learned along the way? Um, I think our biggest lesson is that this tool really requires people to use it. Um, right now, we've trained people to use it, but we have sort of an unknown sense of how much people are using it, if they're using it at all. Um, and so we we have submitted a survey to get some feedback, but um, we know that this is dependent on people feeling comfortable with it. And so we did have a series of trainings in October, but we're hoping to 
you know, refresh those trainings uh, in the summer and then just have a continual schedule of, you know, outreach and training and encouraging people to become comfortable with using the tool um, and, you know, make sure that it's as user-friendly as possible as we move forward. Awesome. Thanks, Sarah. Yeah, I really appreciate your emphasis on user feedback and continuous improvement. Um, Jonathan, I know that was really important in the design of MADE is sort of user-driven development of the tool. Can you talk a little bit about how the team incorporated feedback from users during the development process? Yeah, so the beta version of the tool didn't utilize the Urban API, but actually combined the old LA controllers index uh, with the analysis of three sample data sets, uh, which resulted in the creation of various tables. And we recognized early on that this caused a lot of confusion and information overload on a single page. So we collaborated with Urban to redesign the page based on that feedback, uh, eliminating all the unnecessary visualizations and introducing a new summary table uh, while restructuring with different tabs for clarity. And so ultimately our objective was really to make the tool easy to use without the need to constantly reference our user guide. Awesome. Thanks, Jonathan. I really appreciate that. And something that we have thought about ourselves with the spatial data tool. So it's great to see uh, a shared focus on sort of user-driven development. Um, Sorry, we've been so thrilled to get to work with you all uh, for you know over a year now. Can you talk a little bit about how that collaboration has informed and affected the design of the main tool? Yeah, we've been so grateful to have Urban as a collaborator. Um, you know, this this tool is really heavily using the API, um, and we, as a team, have been learning more about the open source software that powers the API, so that we can uh, have uh, this tool available to us. Um, and Working with you all allowed us to really focus more our work on developing our new city-wide equity index and um, more focus on the research of you know what what makes a great index, and then we were able to combine it with your tool so that we could have this greater sense of ana analysis of where our city resources are. Um, you know, we did. We did do some investigation about what it would take to build something similar from scratch, and we quickly realized that that would be very expensive and take a lot of time, and we're just so grateful that you've been willing to work with us for the past year. Um, and as we move forward, we do want to, you know, further explore how we can, you know, use that open source software and integrate it with some of the more um, existing products that the city uses for data, including, you know, things that are more proprietary, like ArcGIS and uh, some of our city departments use um, Tableau or other types of pri priority uh, data analysis tools. So um, we're excited to see how those can integrate better in the future. Awesome. Thank you, Sarah. And I, I just think you, you struck out something that's really at the heart of why we're excited about the API is that we don't want folks to have to start from scratch. And by sort of picking up the API and using it as a starting point, that hopefully frees up time for people to be able to bring in the pieces that you know only they can do and speak to your you know local expertise and context and you know bringing that to the table along with uh, the API to create something really powerful. Um, Jonathan, one question that we get a lot is about finding data that you can use with the spatial equity data tool or the API. Can you talk a little bit across LA, sort of what data sources are you envisioning folks could use with the MADE tool? Yeah, so many cities should have an abundance of data that can be analyzed through the tool as it exists. Um, our city in particular has an open data portal uh, called LA Hub that stores an extensive amount of geographic data that we use to analyze in the tool. And we actually have some preloaded data sets uh, from that open data portal uh, that serve as samples for the API uh, that include data on access ramps, street lights, and cooling centers. Um, and we're also training program managers across other city departments to be able to use the tool uh, with their own department's uh, proprietary data. Awesome. Thanks, Jonathan. Um, Sarah, what advice would you give to folks? Hopefully there are folks here who are going to be inspired by y'all's example and interested in creating their own tools using the API. Uh, so what advice would you give to people who might be starting the process 
of building a tool using the API or incorporating it into an existing tool. Yeah, definitely. I think what's most important is to think about what you're using it for and who you want to use it. Um, for us, we have a wide range of users that we'd like to be able to use it, including program managers, but also decision makers, which may be people in elected office. So we really wanted it to be simple and easy to use and understand. Um, also, you know, again, training is so important because we really want people to feel comfortable using it, be literate in what it means. Um, and so the more that we do outreach and training um, and showcase it, the more I think it'll be used. We've recently started doing a road show where we're going to different uh, elected offices to explain the tool again. We did that earlier and now we're doing it again and we'll probably do it again next year <laughs> <laughs> just so that more people can feel comfortable it. And then um, think about your process, where does it fit in? We're using it within our budget process uh, so that it's a resource at the moment. So our budget forms ask to ask a question about how do you use data? And then we're using this as a resource for departments to answer it. At this point, we're not making it mandatory if departments have done something different, you know, if they work with a consultant to do a different analysis or, um, for example, our bus shelter system has done a very comprehensive analysis about where bus shelters are lacking. And so we don't want them to recreate that analysis they've already done. But if there's departments who are just starting, this is a, a place where they can start. Um, and then we are looking for partners to provide stories of wins. So we've been very fortunate that our Bureau of Street Lighting has uh, has used the tool um, and has is, is a department that we can use as an example of uh, how they're thinking about where they where they see need for future investment in streetlights. Oh, thanks so much, Syrah. And I, I really appreciate how your team has really focused on sort of taking this tool you've created and bringing it to existing processes. Like you said, you know, let's not reinvent the wheel and really sort of meeting people where they are. I think that's such a great example for other folks. Um, I want to leave time for the open audience Q&A. So I'm going to ask sort of one final question uh, direct different parts to each of you, which is basically what's next uh, for the main tool. So maybe Jonathan, I'll ask you to start. Can you talk a little bit about in terms of new features and new development, uh, sort of what's on the horizon for the main tool? Yeah, so currently uh, the API works best with uh, data that has specific geographic coordinates. Uh, we're hoping to expand that functionality to be able to analyze uh, unique situations uh, and city assets such as street segments uh, that are linear um, and also parks that may cross multiple census tracts. Um, we currently can use things like intersections, gates, or other points as proxies, uh, but we're also interested in investigating how else we can use that uh, polygon data with the tool. Uh, and most importantly, uh, geocoding certain addresses is definitely a big issue and also getting data that uh, needs to be crosswalked uh, in order to translate uh, to be recognized uh, with the current uh, the current way that our equity index is set up with uh, census tracts uh, is also something we're exploring. Awesome. Thanks, Jonathan. I know that answer speaks to a lot of questions we've gotten in the Q&A of folks asking similar things about how they can use the spatial equity data tool with different types of data. So we're excited to learn with you and share those learnings out uh, to the whole body of users with spatial equity tool. And then, Sarah, maybe final thoughts uh, from you before we turn it over to the audience. Can you just talk a little bit a bit more about how you're going to integrate MADE into the budget equity process moving forward? Definitely. So our budget equity process um, has a few different components, but predominantly what we're doing is we're providing training to departments, to city departments on how they can think about equity, how we as a city define equity, so that when we're thinking about how to apply existing resources or any new resources, um, we can have equity as a frame, framework, a shared framework. And our budget forms have a series of questions regarding equity, um, including a question about how we use data to consider equity. Um, right now, the tool is really more of a resource, but we're hoping that over time, um, as people become more comfortable with the tool and uh, as uh, our decision makers become more comfortable with the tool, it can become either more of an expectation, like an, uh, 
not not a requirement, but just like a known expectation that you use the tool or potentially one day become a requirement that you use this tool in, in, in the process of requesting resources. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. So such exciting things already accomplished and on the horizon. And just thank you both so much for being here for your time and insights and partnership. Uh, we really appreciate it. Um, so I'm going to turn it over to Sonia, who is going to lift up some of the questions that we've gotten in the Q&A box. Perfect. Thanks, everyone. Uh, the panel was super interesting. It was amazing to hear a little bit more about the tool. And I also want to thank everyone in the audience uh, for the amazing questions. Uh, it's been very lively. And I want to say now that uh, we're going to do our best to get through a lot of them. I'm going to try to combine some questions, but no worries if we don't get to your question, we're going to follow up after the webinar. So let's get us started. Um, Elena, we've just talked a lot about the MADE tool, um, and there were a couple of questions about uh, perhaps other examples and use cases for the API. For instance, Adrian is wondering about examples of public facing applications. So maybe can you speak a little bit more about that? Yeah, absolutely. And I'll just say, I think one thing we're really excited about with the API is to learn all of the different possible applications. Like I said at the top, I think we're continuously delighted and surprised by the great ways folks think of to use you know, public data tools when you release them to everyone. So uh, we would love to hear your all's thoughts about what you're interested in. But maybe just one example of a public facing application we're excited about and would love to pursue is the idea of potentially integrating the tool into a public facing sort of data portal or dashboard that might already exist. Um, we've talked with a few cities uh, that have their own equity dashboards that are public facing around incorporating the analytics from the tool into those dashboards as just sort of another compelling data point and to track progress towards distributional equity goals. Um, another example is in open data portals, which Jonathan gave a great plug for open data portals in his answer. Um, and so one thing we're excited about is the ability of sort of our API to speak to the APIs that exist in many of those open data portals that could enable doing things like integrating automated representativeness scores into data sets that are made available on these data portals. Uh, so sort of folks could look at the distribution of the data um, as they're sort of engaging with and using the data. So those are just two examples that we're really excited about uh, and are excited to learn others. Nice, okay, great. Um, Gabe, I'll direct this question to you. Um, perhaps to discuss a little bit more about the custom baseline data set functionality. So we got a question from Rosalind that asks, we need more specific levels such as percentage of poverty or percentage of family median income rather than just the broader low income. And they were also wondering about needing more detail on children by age and age groups that are different from perhaps the ones that we currently have, zero to two, three to four, et cetera. And so they ask, can we set this criteria or is it canned as in the example? Yes, thank you so much for that question. Um, so the answer is, as of the release of the API, it is no longer canned. So that is one very exciting thing about this um, process that we're excited to share. So the web tool will not allow this functionality, but in the using the API, so if you call the API directly or you could use the setter R package, you can upload what we're calling supplemental data sets. So you need to have data sets at the census tracts level of the geography you're, um, you're analyzing. So say you're looking at the state of Virginia, you would need for each census tract in the state of Virginia, you would need data on, on that comparison population. So as an example, you're like children ages zero to two, or the count of people in poverty, or the, um, so you need that count data set. But you can upload that to the data set, and then you can upload whatever point data set you're comparing that baseline population against, and then the tool will return to you the um, geographic or dem demographic disparity score calculations. Great. Awesome. And I'm keeping up. There's a lot of new questions coming up. But again, like I mentioned, uh, if we don't get to them, we'll get to them later. Um, Elena, we've received a number of questions and even some of the new ones I was checking um, are about the geographic scale of analysis. So maybe can you talk a little bit more about this, uh, you know, questions about block groups, questions about zip codes, um, different tracked levels. So maybe speak a little bit more about that. Yeah, for sure. Um, so there's sort of two different 
types of geographies that are relevant to talk about. So the first is I know we got a question earlier about sort of when we're thinking about access to a resource, like what do we think of as the service area for a resource? So right now we think about access in terms of the census tract, which is a rough proxy for a neighborhood. We know definitely not uh, equivalent, uh, you know, in all cases. Uh, and so we say, you know, the folks living in a given census tract have access to the child care center or the library in that census tract. We then allow for different sort of overall geographic levels of analysis. So you can look across a whole city, county, state, or even nationwide to look at that demographic disparity score. So if you want to know, you know, across all the census tracts in the state of Virginia, to borrow Gabe's example, um, which groups are sort of over or underrepresented with access to the resource, you would pick a state level analysis. And we also allow city, county, and nationwide. Um, not to steal my own thunder from the closing, but one thing that we're really excited to uh, introduce soon is uh, sort of the ability for other conceptions of sort of the service area of resources and even letting users um, introduce, define their own custom service areas. So that's something that we will be uh, exploring and experimenting with uh, over the next year, because that's definitely something we've heard as an area of interest from folks, uh, and we look forward to sharing with this group what we learn and hopefully some exciting new functionality to come. Nice. Awesome. Thank you. Um, Sarah, we had one question from JoLynn um, about peer learning and the idea potentially of having a community of practice, which I think is a great idea, and we'll take it back. But maybe, Syra, could you say a little bit more about how you hope the main tool will help build a data community across your departments in Los Angeles? Yeah, definitely. Um, right now, the city, uh, we we do partner with our city departments a lot. A lot of it is currently been one-on-one -on -one outreach from our department to different city departments. Um, but, you know, there are quite a few different um, people in the city who have access to a lot of data, who do a lot of thinking about equity, um, particularly our um, public works department, our uh, department of city planning, our transportation department, um, as well as quite a few others that have GIS staff. They have more technical staff that can do quite advanced data analytics on their own. And so working with them to think about how we can make this tool better and more usable. Um, I did see in the just to throw out this in, I did see someone in the chat talk about, you know, transportation um, access and how there's so many different ways to think about transportation access. So we're excited to continue working with our Department of Transportation to think, um, you know, how this tool can work for them. But then we're also excited that this can just be a baseline for some of our smaller city departments that don't have, you know, GIS specialists and don't have data folks to use the tool. So the so I guess um, what we're doing is we're working with our more technical city staff to create something easy for those in the city who don't have that technical expertise to use the API. Um, and that's that's really our goal. So I think that's great advice. Yeah, I, we actually had another question in the chat that I saw about someone who's very interested in the use of the tool, but maybe doesn't feel super comfortable with their own technical expertise. And I feel like that's a great piece of advice about seeking collaborations across, depending your organizational uh, framework, right? If you're in government or nonprofit uh, and try to build those collaborations with some technical staff. Um, great. Okay, Elena, we've gotten some questions about privacy of the data uploaded. Uh, ben, Amy, Brad, and some other folks have asked about what happens when the data is uploaded, how long it's stored, all those sorts of questions. So Go for it. Yeah, for sure. Uh, definitely a question we get often. So thank you all for asking about this. So when you upload data uh, to the tool or the API, uh, it goes into our private cloud storage, um, which we use Amazon Web Services for our cloud provider. Um, so the storage is private, except for you know the research team that are tool managers. We have access to the objects uh, that are in our storage, uh, but otherwise nobody else can access it. And then uh, we automatically delete all of the raw data that you upload, as well as the results of the analysis our tool performs every seven days. So uh, we store it very temporarily uh, for you to see it and download it, and then we regularly delete it. Um, so we like to tell folks is, you know, the system is really secure, um, but that said, you know, there might be certain sort of legal requirements around highly confidential data, um, or specific data use or data MOUs that might 
not be compatible uh, with the fact that, you know, for example, the urban uh, team maintaining the tool has access to the data. And so just to, you know, check uh, your sort of prevailing agreements governing any data before uploading it to the tool, and just generally to avoid uploading highly sensitive and confidential data to the tool. And sorry, one last coda on that is if you do have highly sensitive and confidential data you'd like to use, uh, as Gabe and Sonia both mentioned, sort of all of the code that powers the tool is totally open source. And so something we would love to do is think about how you could sort of take our methodology and then adapt it to run in an environment uh, that works with your data needs. Perfect, thank you. Okay, one last question, Gabe. We got a lot of questions about potentially elaborating the tool to non-point data. Um, Emily talks about um, you know, polygons of service areas. Sam asks about integrating transportation networks, so maybe line data. Just say a little bit more about that. Yes, happy to. Thank you, Sonia. So we have had a number of discussions about uh, different data sets um, or kind of types of spatial data that we can incorporate into the tool. I think um, it's hard for us to to want to do this um, for a couple of reasons. One is it's a technical lift, but I think perhaps more kind of concerningly is we're we're we want to think about our conceptualization of access. And so I think our concern with um, some some types of these is like how we assess if a census tract has access to uh, different transportation networks, for example. So that's um, definitely a thing that's on our radar and we're, we continue to talk and think about it. But I think right now the tool is most well-equipped for handling point data sets. That being said, I think there is a potential chance for, for users to use um, polygons in some situations if you translate your polygon to a centroid or like a single point at the center of your polygon, particularly if that uh, if that polygon geography is at or smaller than the census tract scale. Um, so in, if, in that case, we would encourage you to use the weighting feature of the tool, which we haven't mentioned a lot, but um, again, to plug our documentation, we have good documentation about that. So that might be one caveat for the non kind of point data that you want to use with the tool. Perfect. Thanks, Gabe. And of course, a big plug for people who have ideas about how to do this. We want to do it well, and we're looking for partners to do that. So Elena, I'll pass it back to you. We had a bunch of questions, including one from Riley Morrison about what's next with the API. And I think that that sounds like a great way to close this webinar. So over to you. Awesome. Thank you so much, Sonia. And if we could bring the slides back up. Um, but while we're doing that, just want to say a huge thanks again to Syrah and Jonathan for joining us today, uh, for sharing your insights with us, uh, and Gabe and Sonia as well for your excellent thoughts and presentation. Um, so speaking of coming soon, um, so one uh, thing that we're really excited to be releasing soon is an upcoming resource library. Um, you know, this I think will speak to a lot of the questions that we got in the Q and A. Uh, that could do deal with how you pre-process different types of data, like data with addresses or data that's polygons to work with the tool, um, different case studies and use cases of how folks have used the tool, um, along with sort of code samples and detailed guidance documentation to really make it easy for folks to sort of pick up and use the tool. And I uh, also love the question about a community of practice. I think something we'll think more about, um, but we're excited to sort of share learnings uh, across our different partners with the broader community through this resource library. And then I mentioned this briefly in the Q&A, but we'll also be testing different distance-based access measures to think about sort of the service area of a resource in a more customized way. Um, and so then just in closing, um, oh, sorry, go back. Echoing uh, what you know, Gabe and Sonia and everyone has said ad nauseum is we really would love to hear from you. So uh, we have the link here to our documentation. Uh, I would really recommend that's where you go to get started with the API. It includes the actual API links themselves, instructions for how to download and use the setter R package, as well as example code chunks in R and Python. So really just a one-stop shop for getting started, getting going with the API. Um, I've also included our team email on this slide. It's sedt at urban.org. Uh, we truly would love to hear from you. Um, I think to the question about sort of 
extend, expanding the tool to work with different types of data. We're super eager to partner with folks to you know, think really creatively and broadly about how this tool could be used and how it could integrate into different workflows. So please reach out with questions, with interest in partnership. And finally, um, we'll definitely keep you all posted about these exciting changes on the horizon for the spatial equity data tool. Um, so, you know, we have your emails from signing up for this event. So we'll only use them very sparingly uh, to share major updates that might be of interest. So keep an eye out for those. Um, and just once again, I want to thank everyone so much for taking time out of your day for being here. Uh, we really appreciate it. And we're really excited to collaborate with you to use the API. So thanks again to all the speakers. And I hope everyone has a wonderful day.